Here we are, episode two, week two. We uh, we felt we did so good last week, we're going to give it another roll. We are semi-live with the MCT podcast. This is, as I said, episode two, and uh, I am here uh, along with my co-host, Michael, on my screen, he's on my right, Todd A, down below me at Toddle 5. We, uh, we did something this week. We put, as you can see on our screens, um, we have our, Michael and I have our Twitter ats on there. So go ahead and give us a follow. Check us out. We got some spicy takes, a lot of memes, a lot of good conversations on there. Uh, Tade doesn't believe in Twitter. He doesn't think it exists. So he does not have a Twitter, but you can find him Title 5 at a handful of different places, including DraftKings and Reddit. Um, we are jumping right into, so one of the things that you're going to see each time you join us on the MCT podcast is we will end each episode with uh, our game of the week or a pick of the week to watch. And then what we're going to do the next episode is revisit those picks of the week and see how dumb we looked. So super fun, obviously. And uh, so we are going to uh, dive right in. And uh, Michael, why don't you take it away for uh, recap us on what your pick of the week was last week and how that played out. Well, I came out and said that Gilbert Burns was going to be walking away with the belt at last week's fight. And I was very fucking wrong um, to be very blunt. Um, Gilbert Burns, I mean, I didn't, I didn't realize this. I mean, we also should have dug a little bit deeper into it. But uh, Kamaru Usman, who is the current belt holder, uh, was actually a close friend and close teammate of his. And while Usman just said to just seem to you know switch it on and just drill him any chance he could, Gilbert Burns didn't have that usual edge, that usual fire that he normally had. Now post fight, because um, it ended again very quickly, knockout. Just kind of sad to see from a man who had been so highly touted. Um, Usman decided to call out Jorge Masvidal. Um, some people may know him as the. Well, as one, I think he still has the BMF title, which is bad motherfucker, as just handed down to him by The Rock himself. Um, so the last time those two guys fought, he actually fought Jorge Masvidal on four days notice. Had four days, said, hey, you're getting the call. You have to come down here and fight. Normally, it's a four to five week process. So that was kind of a, kind of a tough fight for him. But he held his own, finished the fight. And he has, he's had that itch saying that, you know, if I had more time to actually truly prepare that would have been a lot different. Um, so that is looking like Usman's next challenge. After that, I don't know where he goes because um, he would have beaten everybody at least more than once uh, while holding the belt. But it's going to be really interesting as that's all because I'm kind of tying in my UFC takes with this too. Um, but yeah, I, I was very wrong on my picks. Thank God you didn't bet on anything I do. That's why we leave the betting to Tade. <laughs> so uh, I took a different route. I looked down to the NBA, uh, see what was coming up on the week. And if y'all remember, I was really excited about Tuesday night's um, late primetime matchup, if you will, between the Brooklyn Nets and the Phoenix Suns. Uh, my prediction, I want to give myself a little bit of credit because I was almost exactly right for being wrong. Uh, I knew that it was going to be a high-scoring game. I'm not going to lie. It doesn't take a genius to know that neither the Nets or the Suns play great defense. Um, so I knew it was good. And they both have high powered offenses. So it doesn't take a genius to put two and two together there and realize that both teams with bad defenses and good offenses is probably going to lead to a high scoring game. Woo. That was a tough one. Um, I had predicted that it would be 130 to 125 in favor of Phoenix. And the final score turned out to be 128 to 124 Brooklyn. So, I had a five-point win for Phoenix. It turned out to be a four-point win for Brooklyn. I, eh, I'm close. Uh, what Wait. really kind of, yeah, <laughs> wins, losses, doesn't matter in sports. Come on. We don't follow that stuff. So what really caught my eye, and uh, as I'm sure it did a lot of you who ever tuned into that game, Brooklyn was down 19 points at the half. Uh, if I remember correctly, Devin Booker had 16 points in the first quarter alone. So Phoenix was cruising. Uh, and... Then in the second half, uh, Phoenix offensively couldn't kind of keep that pace, and they had to rely on their defense. And as I mentioned, they're not a great defensive team. They faltered a bit down the stretch. Brooklyn ended up scoring 40 points in the fourth quarter to complete the comeback and win that game. Uh, Phoenix put up 75 points in the first half and only 49 in the second half. 
So that scorching hot offense really cooled off. Uh, I'm really impressed. I was really impressed by the Nets in this game because they won. They scored 128 points and won this game without Kevin Durant or Kyrie Irving. Very tough to do that. Uh, it's is a disappointing loss for Phoenix, but I think it's a loss they can learn from. They're still a young team outside of you know Chris Paul. They're a very very young team. Yeah, and I mean they they're gonna need to. It's the way sports work, right? You have to take your lumps. You know, you, you can't kind of coast to a win, and you know when you think you got it in the bag, you can't turn. You can't step off the gas. Uh, at this high of a level, teams are going to make you pay for that no matter what the score is. So Phoenix falls down the stretch, but I think they're going to grow and learn from this loss, and they definitely need to do that if they really are going to make any kind of deep playoff run this year. If you look at the stats from that game, Harden uh, had a very, very good game, and I don't like admitting that. I'm not going to lie. He had a very good game. He dropped 38 points on 14 of 22 shooting, 5 of 11 from 3, and he was only 5 of 5 at the line. So 100% from the free throw line, but he only took 5 shots where he usually likes to live there. So really impressed. He had a great game and he needed it uh, without KD or Kyrie there that that night. Chris Paul was the leading scorer for the Suns. He had 29 points on 12 of 20 shooting. He hit four threes and he was one of one at the line. So a good game. It kind of was what I thought it would be that primetime matchup. I disappointed that, you know, I didn't pick the winner correctly, but I think every reason that I wanted to tune into that game was on display that night. So it happens. Tade, what you got? Well, I've got a game that's ice cold. (laughs) <laughs> for my game of the week, Houston versus Dallas. And unfortunately, oh that game was postponed <laughs> because the state of Texas was ice cold. Yeah, it <laughs> froze it over, actually. Uh, but hope, uh, you know, right now with uh, Houston having some uh, COVID troubles and mm-hmm. having that game postponed as well due to inclement weather, you can say, right. too, attributing to that. But mm-hmm. We won't see them playing the Pacers coming up this week either. Right. Um, but I'll talk about the Pacers' struggles with threes uh, this week. Uh, okay. Doma Sabonis hates me because I told him <laughs> the man hits threes. And then the first game after this podcast, he didn't hit a single three. <laughs> so thank you, Domas. You are a wonderful human being. Thank you for making me look like an ass. You're a beautiful <laughs> man. And then uh, Lakers had some troubles, too, that caught my eye with uh, Anthony Davis having some tendonitis with his Achilles and having a calf yeah. strain. So he's out for now. And so is Dave yep. Schroeder. So wonderful yep. week for basketball for me. I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, don't worry, guys. We are going to get way into the NBA this time around. We're, we're prepared. We plan this stuff out. We're ready to go. We're going to jump into the NBA. But first and foremost, there's a reason two of the three guys you see on your screens are wearing Colts hats tonight. So there's two guys on here, and they're all, all three of us, spoiler alert, are in fact Colts fans. At least I believe so. But we are jumping into the NFL. We are kind of semi-officially into the off season and you know looking at next season already time of year so a really fun time of year kind of the pre-draft you know time of year ramping up to a lot of important activities where i you know people would argue i would argue that championship teams are made you know in the winter this is this is kind of how you you set yourself up for success and the colts went out and made a move um, a move that I think everybody kind of was waiting on to see what would happen with them and how it would go. Uh, but the Colts go out and they get their quarterback. They went out and they made a trade with Philly for quarterback Carson Wentz. And uh, I'm going to kick it over to Michael. Michael, go ahead and kind of let us know. Talk to us a quick second about the new Colts quarterback. Well, just letting people know who hasn't, who possibly were living under a rock and haven't seen the deal, the Indianapolis Colts gave up a 2021 third round pick and a 2022 conditional second round pick that could be a first round pick if he plays 75% of the snaps or 70% and the Colts make the playoffs. Now, the last time this head coach and quarterback pairing happened, we saw the best out of Carson Wentz. He finished the 2017 season while injured, and he was posting MVP numbers. Over 300, 3,200 yards passing, 33 touchdowns, seven interceptions with a QBR of 101.9. And even with his injury, he still finished on the MVP shortlist. Now, that being said, he hasn't finished three of the last four seasons. That's why I made the comment last time you know, about him having 
paper skin and glass bones. Mm. Um, he just needs to show that he can stay healthy. And I do believe that with his offensive line, he can do that. Now this past season where we saw how we saw him get benched for uh, Jalen hurts. Um, he tied his career low in touchdowns at 16 and posted a new career high in interceptions at 15, as well as a career go and career low in yards played yards, sorry, yards in 26, 20 and only 12 games played. Now, again, like I said earlier, this pairing couldn't be more beneficial. The Colts gave up. I gave up. They they let slip Tom Brady by because Frank Reich wanted his guy. Now, in hindsight, might not have been the best move, but I'm still okay Frank with it. Frank Reich definitely. I mean, I do. I am too. I don't know I don't, if I could ever see Tom Brady in a Colts jersey. Nope, that's just sacrilege. Can't yep, can't do it. We got a statue of Peyton Manning outside, man. We can't. We can't do that shit here. Um, no. but no, no way would I want Tom Brady to have as many Colts championship rings as Peyton Manning. I don't. I don't. I don't know how no to feel about that. But um, that. Frank Reich has made it clear to Ballard. He wants his guys. Yes. And they're going to go out and get him his guys. Whereas the previous administration with Ryan Grigson just chose whoever the hell he wanted. And, you know, Chuck Pagano be damned. Mm-hmm. But if he can stay healthy, we can get that man back up to form. And he can stop Brett farming everything. I do genuinely think this is going to work out. And because we somehow, some way, didn't give up a first round pick or a second round pick this year, and with a with a GM that's notorious for trading down and getting more players, we could actually build around this guy. And who knows what could happen? And I'm going to go ahead and pass this back to uh, to Chris then, because I know you had you had some thoughts. Oh man, I have uh, I've been I've been heated really the last day and a half now, and uh, so excited that I'm not gonna lie, I'm super excited that this news broke when it did, so it gave us time to get ready for this week because like, it would have sucked if if this trade came down like Saturday or Sunday and we had to kind of sit on it for a week before we had a chance to talk about it. So As you know, I I wrote I wrote the outline, and he still hadn't been traded yet. So right, like the two minutes after he got traded, I had to sit down and go, "Oh shit, and, I have to repaint cut, everything." Yeah, and cut a whole page cut, out and throw it in. Out. So first and foremost, I think we all, Todd included, need to give a round of applause to Chris Ballard because oh my god. Okay, we're just gonna do that real quick, and then I'll explain. So we're gonna we're gonna just, I mean. An absolute round of applause for this man. Guys, he went out and did it again. This guy just can't lose. Is like, is he DJ Khaled? All he does is win. I don't understand how I don't understand how this guy has it so figured out and like nobody else in the league seems to be on his level. It's insane. It's it's crazy. This guy, so Philly comes out, right? Philly says, Hey, we want to trade Wentz. We know he wants out. We want two first rounders to even answer the phone. We want two firsts. Ballard doesn't blink. Ballard probably laughed it off, kicked back in his office, and said, "Call me when you uh, when when you want to talk." Do you guys realize the reports have come out that the Colts never altered their trade offer to Philly? They offered this trade to Philly weeks ago, and then just freaking sat on it. And then Philly was like. Okay, we'll do it. Like it, Ballard is just so good at what he does. He values players at whatever level he values them at, and then he does not budge off of that value. He has shown you so many times that he is wi- he's willing to pay when he deems it necessary for the for his team. He is not going to overpay because oh my god, if I don't go get a guy, we're in trouble. He he doesn't panic move for anybody at any point. He just says, hey, my guy's not there. I'll make it work until my guy's there. Or, you know, on the other end, he says, hey, my guy's there. I- I'm going to go get him. But he also doesn't make it known. Like last year when he made the, bu- de- you know, the DeForest Buckner trade, who the hell saw that coming before it happened? No one was sitting there saying, I think India might look to move their first rounder. And that wasn't really floating out there to go get Buckner. It just kind of all came to fruition at once. And then all of a sudden, boom, Ballard got his guy. Ballard traded a first, paid him out the wazoo. And, and boom, oh my God, all of a sudden the league is in awe. He did it again. And Buckner obviously backed it up this year. So with all that being said, I've been very vocal this offseason about go get any other quarterback besides Carson Wentz because I just didn't think the price could match what he might bring to the team. 
But now it's a different story because now you haven't mortgaged your future to go get this guy. You, you, you stayed the course. You left yourself. Your window of opportunity is still open. And you were able to go and make a move to get your multi, your hopefully your multi-year starting quarterback. And you know what? We're gonna. I think we uh, we lost one of our co-hosts. Michael ran away once you started talking good about Carson Wentz. My- I'm gonna pick up the slack here while I'm trying to find him, <laughs> and I'm gonna talk bad about this trade. Oh, I'd love to hear this. Please bring it, ladies and gentlemen. Chris said it earlier. <laughs> He said the Colts never changed their offer from what we originally gave the Eagles. That means no one else in the entire league decided Carson Wentz was worth more than a second (laughs) rounder and a conditional third rounder. That's how bad Carson Wentz is. Nobody wanted him from, they could say, you know what? We'll give you two seconds for the man. No, 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 no. Nobody, not even the Bears wanted him. The Bears have Nick Foles on that squad still. And he's probably going like, listen, I'm the exact same dude as this man. I, I am the exact same. I I won that championship for the Eagles, not Carson Wentz. They have me on the team. You don't need him. He's trash. So the Colts but, but, could have had other options. And I'll be Chris Ballard is a smart man. Yes. I'm hoping he brings in another QB possibly from the draft, maybe something in the second round. Well, oh, wait, we can't do it in the second round for next year. This year we can because we gave away a third this year. Yeah. We have other needs to fill. We shouldn't waste a second rounder on a QB. This isn't going to be good for the team, possibly for this year, if we want to fill needs to get a good offense because we still have a line rebuild. We still have a wide receiver core to build. If we can bring in a QB, though, for like – Camp competition, I think that we'll have a solid, you know, squad. Like, we have good competition. We can possibly use Carson Wentz still. He's on contract for two years guaranteed. The Eagles ate most of his salary. Yeah. No. Chris so, was smart about it. But Yes. So, okay. And so here's the other thing. If you want to talk Wentz, I want to talk Wentz specifically. Like, like I gave a lot of props to Ballard for making the savvy move and not overpaying for his guy and bringing him in and giving him a chance without mortgaging the future. That's all well and good. I want to like, I want to talk about what Wentz actually does bring to the table. Cause if you, if you just strip down and look at what he can do, I understand he was objectively like, there's no being around the bush. He was objectively the second worst quarterback last year there's no beating around that bush by by a lot of different measures he was really bad and as michael pointed out he had his career he posted you know his career low or he tied his career low in touchdowns with just 16 and he posted a new career high in interceptions with 15 that's horrible that's not going to get it done i don't care what how good your team is yeah it's really really bad but look that's one season that's a bad season on a bad team that was in a horrible division anyway, that like, like nothing was in Carson Wentz favor last year in Philly. And I understand that Jalen hurts came in and had some flashes, looked a little bit better at times and this and that cool. All well and good. I hope hearts works out in Philly. I really do. But here's the deal. Carson Wentz has all of the tools. And and I'm not saying he's going to go down as the ghost. He's got the tools, but he's now going to be out there like a 40-year-old man who can't run because he'll just snap his ACLs in his legs. Which is great. We had a 40-year-old man who can't run at center last year, and he led led him to 11 and 5. Upgrades, people. Upgrades. We want upgrades. He went 11 and 5 and should have beaten Buffalo in Buffalo in the wild card round. If if Kamiko Ture doesn't jump off sides – or Goggles doesn't miss a 33-yard field goal, or the Bills don't get two amazing sideline catches in the same drive going into the half. I mean, there's a lot of things in that game. I don't want to harp on that game. I could rant about that game for a while. We watched but, that game together. We, I know uh, you yeah. about that game. Oh, yeah. You were the, it was not a pretty sight, I'm sure. So, I mean, it. we're just waiting on. By the way, we're our, Michael's uh, 
having some technical difficulties. His iPad did crash that <laughs> he saw it. It's restarting. So that's what we're going to keep this topic we're going. Good takes here. It's all so right, he people. can. Yeah. And so he can. We're going to he- keep the conversation here. One, this was going to be a big, big talking point for us tonight anyway. So we're going to keep it going so he can he can jump in. But Wentz, I mean, the, the connection between Frank Reich and Carson Wentz is obviously the 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 risk here right like this is the the reason the colts made so much sense for a guy like Wentz is his connection with reich so now frank reich not chris ballard frank reich has kind of stuck his neck out and put himself on the chopping block if Wentz doesn't work out because you know if Wentz doesn't work out the blame is not going to fall to ballard especially because ballard did such a good job at getting him at a at a good price cheap yeah so it's not you know it's not going to fall on ballard it's going to fall on frank reich if it doesn't work out so but the great thing for carson wentz and frank reich is here's the deal to make a guy like carson wentz that elite whatever kind of strat whatever kind of level you want to mark him at where you know not quite superstar elite quarterback oh yeah i mean there we go michael is back and he can talk about the new joe flacco carson Wentz. so he's not wearing number 11 next year because yes he is is not giving him that number and i'm glad to be honest with you yep michael Pittman said he's keeping his number um so if i look this up on twitter right now go for it go for it i mean it might crash your ipad again but go for it that's why i'm using my phone hey smart man um, so yeah, he is not wearing 11. He doesn't know what number he's going to wear yet. Somebody did tweet out a picture I saw earlier today. They were like, he should wear 14 in honor of Frank Reich. And I was like, that would be awesome. Cause that's what he wore in Buffalo. So they can make him wear number 12. He and his number. He's not wearing number 12. No, we're cutting that shit out right now. He is not wearing number 12. Yeah. We'll give no, he also didn't say that he was, wasn't going to give up 11. Cause everyone's still asking if he's going to, he has not so, come out and said one way or another. Anyway, he's on one because one, one's McAfee's number. He's not going to go on the Pat McAfee show and say, "Hey, can I get number? <laughs> that would be a thing. I feel like he boxes. should after all the smack. I'd Pat watch talked about him. Yeah, I'd watch. I'd watch that episode. It'd be great. Pat McAfee um, is my hero. Pat, but we, we love you. Dude, I love Pat. Love Pat, Pat McAfee. Please have us on the show. <laughs> That'd be oh my god, dream. But so so here's the deal though. So to make Carson Wentz as good as he possibly can be, whatever level that is, what does a guy like that need? He needs. An offensive line that'll protect him, which he did not have this past year in Philly. He needs skill position wet and weapons to get the ball out to. He didn't have that last year in Philly. Guess what Pinks he's going to have in spades here in Indy? He's going to have arguably the best offensive line in football. I don't really care who they get at left tackle. That offensive line is still four out of five suit as strong as it can be right now so and they're going to go get a solid left tackle even if or if they draft one trade back and draft one anything like that they're going to get a guy to fill that spot and it's not going to be named quentin nelson i'm telling you right now so i so they're going to figure that spot out and get that offensive line shored up so he's going to have arguably the best offensive line in front of him and he's got young, not just weapons he's going to have young weapons to get the ball to and that that offense knows how to speed speed up and get the ball out of its quarterback's hands a lot faster than other teams. Phillip Rivers had found success once he got into his groove last year because they figured out how to get the ball out of his hands quicker. He wasn't getting hit as much. He wasn't facing pressures nearly as much, and he was able to dump the ball off or pass or get complete short and medium passes to check down guys like Naheem Hines or Jonathan Taylor down the road, and he found Michael Pittman late. I mean, there are a lot of guys. Jack Doyle is a great security blanket like a Zach Ertz is. For that Wentz is used to. And like I said, we know the Colts are going to go make moves. They're going to eat, hopefully re-sign TY, hopefully re-sign Zach Pascal, and or they're going to go trade. I mean, imagine if they go and get a guy like Allen Robinson. That's the other thing. That's the other thing that a move like getting Wentz at the price they got him at does for this team is okay. Now we short up that quarterback spot. We can throw that off the board. Now everything else we have can fill, can help to go towards filling out these holes on this roster that we know are there. They're going to go look at a pass rush. They're going to be aggressive in that market from everything that I've read on Twitter and other places. The reports are they're going to be aggressive in free agency when it comes to pass rushers and wide receivers. So look for them to add offensive weapons to help Carson Wentz not hold on to the ball so long. And so he takes those sacks, those fumbles, those interceptions. You, you kind of take that off the feet off 
of the table, the quicker this offense moves. And you have a guy like I didn't even mention Jonathan Taylor coming into his second year when all he did in his rookie year was the he was the third leading rusher in the entire freaking league with 1,100 rushing yards. And he and he only had one dropped pass in the regular season. He had two in the Buffalo playoff game. Who knows? Maybe they were playoff jitters and shore, shore that up. But so he had three drop passes all year in his target. So Naheem Hines and Jonathan Taylor catch the ball out of the backfield a lot, and they can make a lot of things happen for this offense. So Carson Wentz is coming into easily the best situation that was out there for him. And so I think the table is set for him to succeed. It's just a matter of going out and doing it at this point. All right, rant over, I promise. Well, really quick, just to add yeah, you, uh, a little bit. Yeah, of you point. go ahead. You missed a lot. So, so. <laughs> so um, Carson Wentz, when he had his best football, he had big guys with big catch radiuses, guys like Alshon Jeffrey when healthy, right. Dallas Goddard and Zach Ertz. Indy has Mike, Michael Pittman Jr. And that's it for the, for the mold that really fits what Carson likes to throw to. Don't so I think forget, he targets- real quick, don't forget Paris Campbell. If he can stay healthy, that's a huge chance for Wentz well, to find a deep threat kind of guy. Well, that's the thing. He doesn't, he hasn't played well with deep threats, speedy timing guys, guys like Deshaun Jackson, mm-hmm. Jalen Rager and um, Nelson Aguilar, who are very timing heavy, deep threats. He is not mm-hmm. thrown to those guys. Well, now Nelson Aguilar dropped everything that he touched in Philadelphia. So I don't, I don't know if that's a good comparison, but Deshaun Jackson didn't have the same success that he did when healthy that he had when Michael Vick was a quarterback there, or obviously McNabb's a completely different story. Right. Um, or even when he was in Washington. So like he hasn't had the same level of success. And I feel like they need to get a bigger guy, which is why as much as it hurts me to say, if they don't, if TY is going to have to take a cheaper deal, if he's going to come back, because they're obviously going to be focusing on what Carson Wentz throws too well. And I think it's going to be those bigger bodied guys that you can find that are going to mainly be red zone threats. And then outside of that, I mean, there is four letters run the damn ball, mm-hmm. plain and simple. Take the chances that Carson Wentz has run the damn ball. It's four. Um, <laughs> take the chances for me. that Carson Wentz has <laughs> to fuck it up. Right. And, right. and take it away yeah. because I, I, Carson is a risk taker and I like that. But yes. just like when Andrew Luck was that way in his rookie year, you kind of had to take those chances down a little bit yeah. because it. it was either putting himself in jeopardy or it was it was either getting in some really tight windows that could have easily gone the other way or it was leading to yeah. interceptions yeah. because Andrew Luck did have an interception problem, especially his first couple of years in the league. Mm-hmm. So and that's who kind of reminds me of that style of play a lot is Carson Wentz because he's literally thrown his body and sacrificed himself yes. to, to get plays. And, you know, sacrifice oh, yeah. the MVP season to get a touchdown against a Rams team that in the end That's didn't right. really even matter. That's right. And they, they were already in the playoff hunt. You know, just yeah. protect yourself, get to the postseason, get to the Super Bowl, win the ring. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, and I mean, you're, you're right. He's a total gunslinger. and I But I think the game plan here in Indy is going to be similar to what we saw this year with Phillip Rivers, where if, if, if the offense is doing what it wants to do, you're only going to see a max of like 30 pass attempts from Philip Rivers and now Carson Wentz. So if you limit the pass attempts, you limit the opportunities he has, like you said, to, to mess it up or throw bad interceptions or you know, take a sack and fumble or anything crazy like that. So if the, the way the offense is going to gel, I think is, is just as important as getting a guy like Carson Wentz. I think people are too hung up as well on the quarterback position and the Colts are showing you, and just like kind of just like Tampa Bay just showed us when they won it all. I know they did it with the goat in Tom Brady, but they showed you that they that you don't win it just by quarterback play. You win it with a roster. You win it with defense. You win it in the trenches. You win it with, you know, timely plays, things like that. Hell, if it was based on just quarterbacks, we would have seen Mahomes and, and Rodgers with full healthy teams in the Super Bowl. And who knows what, what that would have looked like. The State Farm so, Bowl. The State Farm Bowl in Tampa, which is State Farm Stadium by the way. So we were this close to uh, to State Farm raking in the dough, just absolutely Legendary. sitting there and just like, we don't even care how this game goes, just bring in your, your wheelbarrows of money. So w- to, to kind of keep it rolling, uh, 
to keep it in the NFL family and the Colts family, I want to know exactly what you guys think this move does to the Colts draft strategy. Specifically, do we think the Carson Wentz trade impacts the Colts draft strategy and how? Michael, I'll give you the floor first since you, you lost like five minutes of time here anyway. So <laughs> tell me tell me if the Colts strat- draft strategy is any different today than it was at this time last week. Well, I think at this time last week, they were still focused on a new left tackle, pass rush, and depth at wide receiver and corner. And depending on if they decide to take a guy like Malik Hooker and move him to corner. What I really think they're going to do, if they don't trade down, they're going to go after a left tackle first. You got to protect your quarterback's blind side. We saw how much of a staple Anthony Costanzo was from playing with Peyton Manning to Curtis Painter and to Andrew Luck. He I mean, kept that three, man. They kept those guys three, upright. Three legends right there. I don't know. <laughs> I'll go get on. my Curtis Painter jersey oh right now. Oh, my God. <laughs> Should have done that um, when you had your break. (laughs) I should have. It's it's downstairs. I know exactly where it is. Um, But I think if they, I think they're going to decide to pull back. I think they're going to try and get another second round pick and, and the third round pick that they lost. I think they're going to take in the second round, a higher tier left tackle. It's a very deep draft always of left tackle and wide receiver, or they're going to go aggressive with a corner because those guys are going to be flying early and often. And they need somebody out there because Rocky Asin can't stop with the DPIs. <laughs> like, it's just crazy. Yeah. And that's something that can be coached, but he just he gets a little bit too, too aggressive. And then the other things that I was also thinking, you know, right outside linebackers always win a weak spot. Darius Leonard just usually kind of pulls back and you move Anthony Walker to outside. But I don't know if you want to have that. I think you want to have three solid guys back there. And that way you can just let, you know, four beasts rush the quarterback yeah but and we can always use more online depth and wide receiver depth like especially as we get later into the draft we have a quarterback we have a project piece in jacob eason and we have a full running back core that is all solid we and we have safety so we have like we have depth there we just need corner linebacker potentially o-line wide receiver I will say, I do think we're going to, I do think the Colts are going to add a linebacker specifically because I don't believe they bring back Anthony Walker. So you're going to find somebody to fill that spot. Um, So even if they wanted to add depth, which is great, I think they're going to need to find somebody to fill Anthony Walker's spot as well. But all right, Michael, I teed it up for you. I I, I thought I I left it easy for you. It was just a, a yes or no question. And it was so easy. The right answer is right there. Hell yes, this move impacts the Colts draft strategy. It's so easy. There's a reason this move came down when it came down. Because now the talk shifts, right? The draft talk shifts from, well, the Colts could potentially trade, put a package together and trade all the way up to go get a guy like Justin Fields or something like that. If that's the way they, if that's the way they want to go get their quarterback. Now, all of that is obviously off the board. You're not trading up for anybody at this point, but definitely not for a quarterback. So yes, that's exactly why this move was made is to shut that talk up, to get that off the boards. And so now you can focus on the stuff. I'm not going to lie. I think Ballard likes building a roster, like uh, likes doing this stuff more than finding his quarterback. I think he kind of thinks finding the quarterback is not necessarily arbitrary, but like secondary where he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll go get a guy to throw the ball. That's fine. But I want to, he's like, I like salivate at like offensive linemen and, you know, linebackers and, oh, let me go, let me go pluck this safety from Utah that nobody's talking about because he's injured in the third round. (laughs) I'm going to go get this guy. Like he loves that stuff. That's the stuff that I think really gets him going. It gets, you know, yeah, I mean, be fun to go get the big quarterback, but I think he, I think he just kind of does that because he has to do that. I think this is the stuff that he likes to do. So I think we are now, as as Michael did mention, I think we are now uh, right looking dead in the eyes at yet another Chris Ballard special, baby. He's gonna trade back. He's not picking at twenty one. What is there to take at twenty one that you can't get in the second round? Like, yeah, maybe a certain guy, but you can find whatever position you were looking at at that point in the second round. So Chris Ballard's salivating right now, guys. He's already, I, I can almost guarantee you, he's already making calls and like, 
Who who wants who wants twenty one? Who's looking for twenty one? I got twenty one here. What do we got? He's he's trying to recoup those picks. We know he loves his draft capital. It probably hurt him to even give up that third rounder because he's like, oh, that was I, I know who I was gonna take that spot, but oh, I gotta give him up. So you know, I'm I we're primed and ready for another Christmas dollar special. He's gonna trade back. Uh, to recoup one or both of those picks that we gave up for Wentz. So look to see him pick up another second rounder. Look to see him or potentially a third rounder, as Michael said, to recoup that third round pick that we lost this year. So, and then, yeah, I think, I think the priority kind of goes left tackle, pass rush, wide receiver, cornerback in, in that order for me. You've got to get your left tackle situated. So, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I expect the, draft board to be pretty high on left tackles as michael said it's a deep class for them this year so ballard knows he's going to be able to get his hands on one of the guys he just kind of has to decide which one he a wants and which one he thinks will be there in the second round when he does get a chance to take him so look for that and then and then who knows there'll be another trade or two i'm sure in the in the draft for some fourth and fifth round picks and we're going to hear guys that we've never seen and they're going to be all pros year one who the hell knows i mean it's just what ballard does guys it's just what he does Tyler, what you think literally everything you guys said is already covered of course draft getting carson wentz changes our entire draft strategy because number one thing we're going to do we're going to want to protect him and give him weapons so we're going to focus on finding a left tackle whether it be in free agency or possibly the draft because a lot of O-linemen this draft, or getting him some weapons, maybe draft some good, young, freshman, sophomore players. You can't draft freshman players, but you know what I mean. <laughs> hey, we draft sophomore players. Yeah, we can draft them. Sure. Uh, look, playoffs come. Who are our best players against the Bills this year? All rookies. Yep. Our rookies stepped up because this team is well-coached, so we can pluck people from college and overseas and they'll be instantly good with our coaching staff because we play hard. Yep. I mean, hell, how excited did you guys get? I mean, Tata, you probably didn't see it because you don't believe Twitter exists, but there's a tweet out there from Darius Leonard himself, the maniac himself, who literally typed a full paragraph. I'm sure he used all 260 characters that he could or whatever the Twitter limit is nowadays for, for those young kids. I don't even know. But he... uh he had a full paragraph on like, hey, any free agents that are thinking about coming to Indy, here's what's up. You're going to play hard. You're going to shut your mouth. You're going to do things the way we do it. And if you can't handle it, deuces. And I was like, holy crap, coming from the maniac himself, like that would get me hyped if I was th- potentially thinking about coming to a spot like Indy. So like that's super exciting. And you know what? That actually is going to lead us right into our next NFL topic that we want to talk about, and that is NFL free agency. Guys, it's that time of year. There are guys out there to go and get. We know the Colts, among the rest of the teams in the league, are going to be aggressive in free agency. Guys are about to get their money. Um, guys' lives are going to change from these big contracts that they're about to be signed. It's it's going to be it's a great time. It's fun every year to kind of predict and see where we think people are going to end up, and then see where they actually end up. So, and I think. Pretty easily, the biggest name out there is a guy who played all 16 games last year, finished with a pick six, two forced fumbles. He did only have five sacks, which is pretty low for him. A 30, he had 36 solo tackles, and 14 of those were, or 14 tackle for, tackles, four losses. I'm talking about the one and only first ballot Hall of Famer, JJ Watt. He is a free agent, unrestricted. For the first time in his career, he is sitting back and letting suitors come to him. And by God, are suitors coming to him? He's already tweeted out the free agency is wild. So I can't even imagine the kind of things he's getting right now in his DMs from anybody, from reliable sources to rabid fans to whatever. The players' moms are probably saying, come play with Jimmy. It's so much fun here in Minnesota. Whatever. So he's going to have a hell of a time deciding between 29 NFL teams not named Houston that are going to give him a phone call just to see what's up, see if they can um, kind of pursue him. So I want to know where you guys think makes sense and where we potentially see a Hall of Fame talent end up at next year. Well, 
my big thing is I don't know if JJ Watt's going to care too much about the money. He's made over a hundred million dollars in his career. I don't know if that's going to be a driving factor in any of this about who's going to pay him more. It's more about what team is built to win and built to win now. So a couple of places that made sense was Green Bay, you know, being a homecoming for him. He played in Wisconsin. He gets paired up with arguably the best talent in the NFL with Aaron Rodgers. And at Green Bay's made the NFC title game in back-to-back years. So if there's a team that is geared to win and geared to win now, it's the Green Bay Packers. The other options that I thought were really good was Pittsburgh. He's playing with his brother. I mean, Pittsburgh was really a piece away, especially on that defense, from actually being halfway decent. And I think with J.J. and T.J. Watt, as long as quarterback gets figured out, if Big Ben doesn't retire, then it could be a really entertaining team in Pittsburgh. And the last one, the obvious choice, Robert Mathis has reached out to this man to bring him to Indianapolis to play those darn Houston Texans, it, a couple times a year. And I think that's going to be, you know, a really enticing offer because we're seeing Indianapolis get aggressive. Getting a guy like J.J. Watt to pair with that, with DeForest Buckner on the D-line, and I don't believe um, 50, oh, shoot. Justin Houston. On the, yeah, did he retire? No. Is he coming no, back? Not yet. Well, he's not. He is a free agent, as far as I know, if I remember okay. right. So he hasn't decided one way or the other if he's going to play, and if he does, uh, it's not sure where just yet. Yeah. Well, I feel like you bring in a guy like JJ Watt, Justin Houston's be like, "Hey, sign me up right now." Okay, and we can we can have, have, we can have one more ride, <laughs> like one more ride in Indianapolis, and then your D line would be Justin Houston, DeForest Buckner, Danico Autry, and JJ Watt. And, and you like also I was forget- talking about earlier. You oh, forgot sorry, the go ahead. sorry. You forgot the best run stopper in football last year. You forgot the best run stopper in football last year in Grover Stewart. I thought you were talking about TJ Speed. No, Grover <laughs> Stewart. That man needs some respect. That man needs some respect. He literally was the objectively, the statistically, the best run stopper in football last year. He had a huge breakout year. Young dude, only getting better and better. So yeah, that D line would be. You're right. Absolutely insane. And I also just think that then this will be this will be the last little bit here for me. I just think again, I said it once, Houston has burned JJ. Mm-hmm. Time and time again, they've had a halfway decent team and he watched it fall apart in his hands. Early in his career, when Matt Schaub, Arian Foster, and Andre Johnson were on the Texans team. And they all just just kind of vanished. You saw Andre Johnson go to Indy. Maybe you reach out to him and be like, hey, Andre, how'd you like Indianapolis, man? And then just here recently, you know, with Deshaun Watson and Andre Hopkins, and we're seeing guys get traded for a bag of chips yep. and a sandwich. Like, and then he said it himself where he just felt like the team gave up on him. He has to be angry in Houston. Maybe not the city of Houston, but I feel he like he loves, has to be angry enough at the Texans. Loves the city of Houston. Yeah. Probably not right I now feel like he's with gonna... it being frozen, but, you know. Yeah. Which, uh, Prayers out to all those guys. T's and P's. Hope hope everything gets resolved soon. Ted Cruz is back. If that helps anything. <laughs> You'll see back this when you guys have power. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. But, um, um, so, <laughs> all right. You got anything else, Michael? Or I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it. That's, that, that's cold, Chris. Would you, say, oh, would, you say, would you say it's frozen? I mean, come on. Now. Ice. So... <laughs> um, so I'm going to make this short and sweet uh, M- Michael and I agree one through three uh, Green Bay makes a lot of sense for J.J. Watt as, as Michael mentioned it's it's a homecoming he played at Wisconsin uh, there's this guy number 12 Aaron Rodgers kind of good at the sport of football helps out a little bit you have an instant shot at a title there as he said they've been to back-to-back NFC title games argue you know we're, we're a play or two away from going to the Super Bowl this year um so, and then if you just look at that defense, 
if you add a guy like JJ Watt and you pair him with a guy up front, like Kenny Clark, uh, that D line can be arguably as good as any in football. And you have great, uh, you know, a, a leading a top tier elite defensive back in Jared Alexander back there. Who's only getting better. He had two picks in that NFC title game. He's got, he is an absolute monster, a shutdown corner can go toe to toe with anybody shut down half the field or, or take away a team's best receiver. So if you have a, if you have a corner that can take away your team's best receiver, a defensive line that can pressure you, I don't really care what the rest of the defense can do because they can kind of sit there in lawn chairs if and and make plays. So Green Bay makes a lot of sense for a guy like J.J. Watt. They're going to have to do a lot of work for the money-wise to make it work because they are already over the salary cap. But they did make some moves today to cut some salary, so I kind of expect them to go after J.J. Watt or somebody else in free agency that's going to cost them a pretty penny because they cut uh, Christian Kirksey and an offensive tackle today, and I'm so sorry that I can't remember his name off the top of my head. But they made two; they cut two veteran guys to uh, shed some salary and try to try to get their finances the way they need to. Um, yeah, don't count out Pittsburgh just simply because he'd get to play with not one, but both of his brothers. And, oh, I can't stand Pittsburgh, but it, I can't deny that it would make sense there just for the family aspect. How cool would it be to get all three Watts in the same team? I mean, just like in the NBA, how much do we want the Holiday brothers to all be here in Indy? Like We would have loved to go get Drew Holiday. So what? that no, would be Milwaukee? really easy. What? Nah, it's fine. So... And then, yeah, I, I I truly believe Indy could be a dark horse in this J.J. Watt race. Their roster is right up there with anybody. They are really, they're definitely coming into their contention window. They've got their quarterback figured out now, whether, whether it works or not, but they at least have that question answered. And simply put, the most appealing thing Indy can offer J.J. Watt, that no matter how good Dream Bay and Pittsburgh are, they cannot offer this. He would get to go against Houston twice a year and especially if they move on from like if they trade Deshaun Watson and they just bring in some other quarterback that JJ Watt has no emotional ties to like JJ probably wouldn't like taking down Deshaun Watson <laughs> let's be real he loves that guy it would probably I mean it wouldn't not do it but you know it would it wouldn't be as fun for him but man if they bring in some no name you know and he's like cool I just get to go after this dude and show up Houston he's gonna have five sacks and five sacks a game and then and those two games I'm telling you he's gonna just be like put me out there every play I don't care I'm rushing get me out of the way get out of my way it's over so uh, Indy could Mind really tight end coach <laughs> yeah but he don't care he's gonna make it happen so those three teams make a lot of sense I've seen some other teams um even like Cleveland some random teams he I mean he's one of those guys that Every team gets better if they add a guy like him. So expect a lot of noise to come up before uh, before any kind of decision gets made on him. Because, like I said, he's just he's such an uber talent and a great human being that he will make any team that he goes to instantly better. So he makes sense on a lot of teams. He makes the most sense if he goes to Buffalo. Buffalo is a championship caliber team. Buffalo is a great outdoor stadium. Buffalo has amazing fans who raise money just like J.J. Watt. They already get along right there. Mm -hmm. In Buffalo, you don't have to worry about really, you know, facing your buddy Deshaun wherever, if you know, he goes to the NFC if he gets traded that way, maybe to the 49ers. So my teams are Bills, mm -hmm. Bills, 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 and, Bills, Bills. And actually to kind of piggyback and add on to that point, I think another thing that people – that some people would scare would be scared away from a team like Buffalo because of the weather and the snow and how cold it gets there, I, I think J.J. wouldn't care about that. And we'd actually entice that because, again, a homecoming in Green Bay, I mean – can't tell me he's not used to cold weather and some snow. He probably loves snow football. I'm the pretty sure a cabin in the woods. So yeah, I'm pretty sure every time he's gotten to play at an outdoor stadium in snow, uh, I'm pretty sure they've made a little story about like how excited he gets to like, he likes playing in the snow. So yeah, Buffalo makes a lot of sense for everything that you said. Uh, the next guy, I don't really know. <laughs> this one's just going to be super fun because I don't really know if he's actually out there on the market, but we're here to have some fun and some speculation, right? So there's a quarterback in Seattle by the name of Russell Wilson who can't, who's his, his personal 
camp brand, whatever you want to call it, his his group has come out this offseason and stated he's not happy with how Seattle has um, well, I think what he called it was they, they Andrew lucked him. They didn't protect him. He got hit quite a lot. <laughs> He's been hit a lot over the years. He's taken so many sacks. And um, and then Russell Wilson came out a couple of days later and basically confirmed it and backed it up and said, yeah, I'm not happy. I'm getting destroyed out there. I have no protection. And so, of course, all that does is open the floodgates to, well, is he getting traded out of Seattle? What's happening here? So we're going to play we're going to play the where where would Russell Wilson make sense game uh, outside of Seattle? Um, so, Michael, where does Russell Wilson make sense outside of Seattle? Well, first thing I want to do is lead off with I don't think Russell Wilson's going to go anywhere, <laughs> but people who are much smarter than we are have been, you know, speculating it. And I feel like it would be a crime if we didn't talk about it on here too. And as I was sitting there, I was kind of thinking about it. There was only really one deal that makes sense for both parties. And that's Houston mm. for Deshaun Watson. Both mm. teams get a superstar caliber MVP caliber quarterback. Okay. Who has shown leadership qualities and traits and can lead a team even a bad team to the postseason as russell wilson showed to the super bowl with a not so great offense yeah the defense of the legion of boom did a lot for him as well a lot a lot but i think if you take him and put him in houston and just show that both parties are happy as long as both teams decide to build around their new quarterbacks it's all going to go over fine. Would sure. I want to see Russell Wilson twice a year? Hell no. Mm-mm. But that's the only deal that makes sense. I don't see San Francisco doing it because Jimmy G is a very expensive quarterback and you have to move him to yeah. like, it almost yeah. seems like it's got to be a QB QB trade, maybe a QB and a pick, yeah. but you have to have that space. I mean, to work with. And just like we don't expect Deshaun Watson to get traded to Indy because it's in division. So I don't expect San Francisco to be able to match whatever Seattle's going to want extra to trade Russell Wilson in, in division. Um, so I actually had a lot of fun with this one as much as I'm going to hate my answer. I had a lot of fun with this one. Okay, so you got to hear me out. Listen. Don't you say it. Listen. The... <laughs> Tade, you'll appreciate this. Actually, Michael, you will too. You both love Star Wars uh, easily more than I do. I love Star Wars, but you guys are you guys are on another level to me. The 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 dark side always calls, right? The dark side always shows up. Okay, especially when they've been quiet for a little bit. You think you've blown up the Death Star. You think it's gone, and the, all there is is they're just silently repairing it, right? You don't even have to say the team name when you just said dark so, side. It's, this is so, obvious now. So so the dark side. Right, the they, they, they kind of went away, right? Like we, 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 we're in between episodes right now. We, we've defeated the dark side. Their weakened forces are gone. Their leader has left them and abandoned them for another team. He, you know, he's gone. They're, they're in shambles. They're trying to figure it out. But what does the dark side always do? The movie, the, the script is written, guys. The movie, like the script is written. You're somehow, some way, the New England Patriots are going to swoop in here and take and get Russell Wilson, right? Do, am I, I can't be the only one that that makes sense to. Like so, somebody back oh. me up. Like somebody. So what like you're trying to. What you're he, trying to say is that <laughs> Bill Belichick is the emperor, and yeah. <laughs> Russell Wilson is just going to be Kylo Ren, just pulled in tell, after Vader so, is gone. Tell me, tell me that. Tell me, answer me this. I'll an, I'll answer you that by asking you this. If the emperor were to cut his robe sleeves off, you telling me you don't see Bill Belichick? I mean, they already I have do, a bigger but... Russell Wilson in New England. They have Cam <laughs> Noon right now. Who's no, they don't. Bigger... Gone. Per- well, Cam first gone. off, he's, he's gone yeah. right now. But he, was on a, he was on a one-year. He was on a if one-year deal. Big, you think they they're they bringing him back? He led no, him to they, six wins. You know, they might. He has to go somewhere. He's not going to the Bears. Yeah, it's not New England. I mean, he. Pro- I he wouldn't might. be surprised if he ends up in Chicago, you. actually. Yeah. But like, they have not they, they will. Russell Wilson they're going to work. They're going to have Russell QB. Wilson want to go to New England. <laughs> because, <a> line. <laughs> because the alert, 
The allure, the allure of the dynasty of the Patriots. So go win a ring there. But, I don't know, man. I don't really think it's going to happen. But come on, you can't tell me you don't see it. I see it. I got a better picture of both of you right now. Oh my god! All right, all right. Well, go, go right ahead. Y'all didn't even appreciate how I tied that into Star Wars. I purposely didn't even have he that in the outline, team. so y'all wouldn't, y'all wouldn't know it was in there, and you still didn't appreciate it. He beat this I'm team done. in the playoffs. And it actually, he beat this team in the Super Bowl, the Denver Broncos. John Elway is no longer in charge of picking players, so he can't pick just tall QBs. <laughs> Sorry, Cam Newton, you're not going there either. <laughs> you know, they can pull a package. You know, Von Miller, they they they're letting him okay. go probably. Just swap them. Okay. You know, Seattle gets a better defense. You know. Give him Drew Locke also. Nobody likes Drew Locke, even though he's average. He's he's below average average. He's a good backup. But, you know, give him your first. Give him Drew Locke. Swap Von Miller. Make salary correct. So, everything sure. works. You know, get a second from it too, maybe, or a third, like, a yeah. far in the future. Yeah. I... I, after hearing everything, though, I, the more I think about it, New England kind of just makes sense because they're the only t- team that has the draft capital to pull that off. They don't have stars. They have draft capital. And realistically, Russell Wilson doesn't have a, doesn't have a choice in this. If, if the Seahawks decide it's time to move on, they'll take the best deal they can get. And if New England just takes a bag of picks and throws it at them from all those years of trading down and trading back, you know, that way Bill Belichick can't draft some no-name safety out of a Division three school. Why would Bill Belichick want somebody who's won awards and titles? He <laughs> wants some just, no face I'm just like right. North Dakota be... State <laughs> who's not even played Trey Lance, baby. I'm gonna I'm gonna be so excited. I, I'm gonna hate I'm gonna love and hate when I end up being right about that. I'm gonna be so pissed. <laughs> but I'm gonna, I will not be happy. But I'm gonna laugh. But I'm gonna laugh. All right, so our our next and uh, yeah, our next and final free agent that we want to talk about, uh, you know, Michael mentioned that Legion of Boom, the Seattle Seahawks defense, and one of, if not the most important piece of that Legion of Boom is about to hit the free agent market, and that is elite cornerback Richard Sherman. He did only play in five games last year, and he had one pick. He's obviously, I mean, he's still Richard Sherman. He's a viable cornerback option if he goes to the right system. Um, and, you know, gets gets his play can't, his snaps limited and taken care of and all of that stuff. He's got some calf issues uh, just with age. He's got some injuries, obviously, but somebody's going to pay the man. There's no way he's not playing next year. So, Michael, where's he ending up? Indianapolis has a longstanding history of revitalizing careers of aging players. Most recent, like most recently, and the one note was Xavier Rhodes. That man was burnt toast his final couple of years in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. And he came out and arguably had a Pro Bowl season in Indianapolis yeah. as their star, as their top corner, along with Kenny Moore. And I feel like when you have a lot of younger players pairing Richard Sherman with Indianapolis to play alongside with Kenny Moore and Rocky Sin and Xavier Rhodes, it just makes sense because you can rotate those guys in and out, especially if you decide to keep Malik Cooker and try him at corner or you move Justin Blackman down to corner. Like you're going to have a rotation of defensive backs to where right. his snap count can be limited. But that brain, that man was a valedictorian at Stanford. Stanford. Give him some. Yeah, absolutely. Give even if credit. he's not, even yep. if he's not going to start, Just he's still going to be a guy you want to have on your team mm-hmm. who can help out in big plays and then help bring, raise the talent of your younger corners. Yeah. Like a guy who actually played, in San Francisco last year, he kind of had a little bit of a resurgence as well. Was Jason Verrett, mm-hmm. and Jason Verrett, I believe, quoted a lot of his success to just kind of listening to Richard Sherman and helping. Richard Sherman helped him grow because he had a few years of injury, like injury issues, stayed off the field for a while. Sure. And Richard Sherman basically being a coach on the field, and then when he was hurt, helping his team on the sideline, it helped a guy like that really raise his performance. So I really think Indianapolis would be a great fit for Richard Sherman, especially if you can get him on a deal. He only played five games. You can get him on a deal. Yeah. Um, so the, it's funny. The reason I think uh, an indie 
Richard Sherman connection doesn't happen may actually be because of the guy that you just mentioned in Xavier Rhodes, because I think the Colts would probably almost rather just bring him back knowing what they can get from him because they just have 16 games of tape now on him in a, in the blue and white with the horseshoe on he, they know exactly what they're going to get from Xavier Rhodes. So if, if the money is kind of similar, why would you go with the quote unknown when you theoretically can go with, Hey, I know this guy worked and my other corners already learned from him. They've already attached to him. Obviously Kenny Moore learned from him, you know, uh, the other defensive guys really seem to grow, draw to him. So if they bring Rhodes back, Sherman becomes less necessary. Can it happen? Of course. Absolutely. What I actually really like is the idea of a Seattle reunion with Richard Sherman. What does Seattle have to lose in bringing a guy like him back? It's not going to, as Michael mentioned, he's coming off five games. He's not going to bring in top dollar anymore or even a long contract. He is probably going to go on a sign a one, maybe two year kind of prove it deal, prove they still got some juice left in the tank. And why would Seattle, what does Seattle have to lose in not bringing back a fan favorite part of that Legion of Boom, that leader? I mean, he's going to sell tickets. He's going to bring butts in the seats if butts are allowed to be in the seats next year. And I mean, it's that kind of makes sense to me. And, you know, if Richard Sherman, as long as, as far as I know, that bridge wasn't necessarily burned when he left Seattle. So the door is probably open for him. So I think for me, just off the top of my head, when I was putting, the, when we were putting this together, the first thing that popped in my mind was, hell, why not a Seattle reunion, you know? Well, I just remember when he signed in San Francisco, part of the reason why he signed there and his ex- explicit quote was, they're the only team that could give me what I wanted. And that was to play Seattle twice a year. Sure. So I don't know if that bridge has been healed per se. It's been a few years. Time heals all wounds. Time, time heals all, baby. <laughs> But yeah, I don't know. It makes sense. Uh, Tade, Tade, buddy, what do you think? You know, I was thinking about it. Does Richard Sherman want to win or does he want to make money? So I was trying to think of places where he could win and he can make money. <laughs> if he wants to win. Why not both? <laughs> yeah, why not both? But he won't get both. Right. Salary cap's probably going to stay the same or go down next year. Mm-hmm. A lot of players are going to be on the open market trying to get one year deal, prove it deals for the year after. But here are my three teams okay. Green Bay, Ooh. maybe to bolster their defense, but they can't pay them too much. That's the issue. Right. Kansas City, bolster their defense also. Can't pay them too much. They got like no money. <laughs> Arizona, they got $3. Yeah. Arizona, yeah. they can pay them. Will he be an at, on an average team? Yeah. Will they win a championship? No. But they could pay him. You know what Arizona also gives him? Can play Seattle twice a year. Hey, and San, and San Francisco twice a year. Uh, if Arizona is picked as his location where he goes to, uh, we should bet on this. <laughs> title, title five, everybody. I, title five on DraftKings. <laughs> I, I actually think... Green Bay might be over Kevin King after oh, yeah. what happened. I don't in expect the championship to see game. He got I don't expect on. To see he got bullied. Oh, yeah. And I don't just expect to take his salary and give it to Richard Sherman. <laughs> just <laughs> take bikini bottom and move it over here. <laughs> over there. Get some white yeah, out, you I know, mean, just <laughs> Well, I think I mean you bring up Kevin King and I, as far if I remember correctly, don't don't rip me a new one if I'm wrong on this one, but I believe he's coming into his fifth year contract, like his fifth year option where the team, like he's coming into a team option year. So they may just cut him. They may get the option to just cut him. So I don't expect if that's, and if that's true, I do not expect to see him back in, at Lambeau field as long as he's a visitor. So, all right. Uh, well, that was our NFL subject. I know we kind of we had a lot there, but we we knew that's going to happen. But we are we're going to switch sports. We're going to switch balls. We're going to we're going to go from from the old pigskin to uh, to the classic orange Spalding ball. We're going to talk the National Basketball Association and get used to this because every time we talk NBA, I'm pretty sure the first topic out of our mouths is going to be about these Indiana Pacers because, again, you've got three Colts fans here. Shocker. You've got three Indiana Pacers fans here. 
Tade is like one and a half because he's got another team out in LA, but it's fine. I got some other teams too. It's all good. So well, we're going to talk about these Pacers. Um, they're, uh, I'll, allu- I'll lead into, I'll let Michael take the reins here, but I'm going to lead into, they are coming off of a win, a nice, fat, confidence boosting W. So Michael, what are, where are we at with these Pacers right now? Um, just really quick, real, real quick shout out to Jamal Murray dropping a 50 bomb in Cleveland. Um, oh, yeah, wow. that's his, that man. I think that's his third 50 point game in his career. Dropped that a man. 50 burger in Cleveland. Rest in peace, Cleveland. That um, man dirty. <laughs> but at the time that I wrote this last night, um, they're four and six in the last 10 games. So it's mm-hmm. still not where you want it to be, but they're contesting every game. Sabonis had a 36-point triple-double for the first time in Pacers history. 36-point pace triple-double against Minnesota on Wednesday. And just a performance like that obviously proves that, you know, he probably should have been an all-star starter, which we'll talk about later. But also at the time of writing this, their next game was going to be against the Houston Rockets. We know how that went. And whenever that game does get rescheduled, I think it's going to be one of the bigger games of the Pacers season because it's, it's, it's not Pacers versus Houston. It's Pacers versus Oladipo. If Oladipo is another move at the trade deadline in Oladipo's 11 games in Houston, he's averaging 18.4 points per game, 4.9 assists per game, 4.9 rebounds per game. He is definitely not the superstar that Houston thought they were snagging on the cheap deal. He has also been less than 30% from three since the trade and 39th overall in points per game. So I still think in that game, again, whenever it gets rescheduled, mm-hmm. Oladipo is going to go off because it's a team that quit on him. <laughs> but the Pacers are going to win by 40. So it's not going to matter. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I mean, it, it's tough, right? It's I, I think I saw one tweet the other day, and I wish I could remember the indie sports writer who, who tweeted it. I follow just about all of them, so I kind of get them mixed up every now and then. But one of them, one of the tweet I saw really summed up this season kind of poetically perfect for me. It, it does it kind of just feel like the recycled Pacers of every single year, where they're competitive to a point, but they kind of smash up against that glass ceiling of not being able to break through into that that next tier, that upper echelon, that two to three seed, not even the one seed, but that kind of two to three pretty dominant. Maybe they can put some things together and who knows, but instead they, they, they they look to be right at that Pacers wheelhouse of the four to six seed, probably give you a competitive first round series and then have a nice long vacation. I mean, that, that that's kind of, to me feels like how this year is going. And again, I know that, the injuries are obviously a factor. You can't control that. Uh, the great news is TJ Warren has been spotted back with the team. He should be back in action in hopefully like less than a week or so. Don't quote me on that again, please. Ah. So, you know, we're hoping to see him real soon. Obviously, Karis Levert has got to get healthy. He's got to take care of himself first and foremost. Basketball is not the most important thing for him or really for anybody. And, uh, it, it, you know, take care of your health. As Marshawn Lynch would say, you know, count your chickens, take care of your mentals, do you know, so he needs to do that. And then, man, when he's ready to go, think about what the Pacers starting lineup could look like. Just think about a line, a starting lineup, if you will, of Brogdon, Karis LeVert, Jeremy Lamb, say TJ Warren, and then probably Sabonis. And then, and then you've got, and then think about the bench. You've got TJ McConnell, the Holiday Brothers, Doug Buckets, Dougie Buckets down there. Oh, and Miles Turner leading that second unit at that point. I mean, you're talking about a team that is not only eight or nine players or even 10 players deep, but if you just look at that starting lineup that I mentioned, you can make an argument that you have four, if not five, 20 plus point scores a night on that lineup with Brogdon exploding this year, the way he's exploded 
Sabonis doing what he does. TJ Warren is a natural scorer. Karis LeVert is an athletic natural scorer. And Jeremy Lamb is that streaky shooter, you know, that every team kind of has that on and off. So, I mean, that's an offense that can run with just about anybody. If the defense can kind of hold still and figure stuff out, you know, new Nate is obviously still new. There's a reason that's in his name. He's got to figure out. I mean, his system is taking some time. It's taking its lumps, but he's a brand new head coach still. It, it, it's hard to really throw a lot of blame on him because one, he's had things thrown out of like injuries that, you know, he, he can't control. So he doesn't have the guys out there that he want, needs to have out there Two, his, like I said, his system just takes some time and it's a whole new culture system that Pacers are used to. It's an entirely new offense. Sometimes the, it still seems like that old stagnant, not really ball moving offense that we've seen, but they, they, we've seen a lot of flashes and even long stretches of higher offensive output. Way more threes are being taken. They finally are starting to look like a 2020 basketball team, and we're in 2021. So, I mean, they're they're working on it. It It's just tough. You've had two stars, if not superstars, in the last five years, you know, get forced their way out of Indy. You've had to rebuild from that. So it's just it's it's really tough on a team to know what this looks like. And who knows when that Houston and Indy game gets rescheduled to, but I'll tell you right now, Michael, if it's on the second night of a back to back, Oladipo's not gonna play. It don't matter. So never know. But yeah, I mean it's it's tough. It's just tough to know what these paces are right now. To Thirty games, thirty five games in a season. It's just it's tough. Hopefully they get it sorted out and get healthy, and and can kind of show you what their potential could be. Tade, what are you seeing from the Pacers, man? You've been awful quiet. This is your this is your game. This is your sport. Get on in here. You know, if you guys watched the uh, Minnesota game we played against, you know, Carl Anthony Towns is back. Yep. Pacers can so not play defense. Him. We play, as Game of Zones would say, double the offense, half the defense, which is fine. You know, that's a modern NBA team. Yep. But if we come up against all-star level centers, we struggle. We always do because that just opens up a hole and other people can score and shoot. Yep. I think Pacers just need to revitalize themselves a little bit on defense. You know, sure. have Miles be more of an anchor. I know he wants to play a four position more often than not. He does get blocks, but someone's got to go up against centers. And I think that's the big issue coming up for the Pacers until they get Warren and Levert back mm. to play some more defense. Yeah, I think I think he hit the nail on the head there. Defensively, they got to step up, especially as you mentioned, against bigger, stronger those Andre Drummond type centers who always seem to go off for 2020s against the Pacers uh, because Miles Turner and now even Sabonis just, I don't know if it's just, they don't have the right mindset or the physical tools necessary to, to kind of keep them out of the, keep those big, strong bam out of bios out of the post. They, they struggle with those bigger athletic guys. Um, I mean, we can get that, Drummond. He's on the trade block, but I'm not paying him 28 million. That's true. No, that's very God, no. It'd be hilarious. So you talked about the trade block, and that is a perfect little segue. Uh, Tade knows exactly how to uh, podcast, as they say. So uh, he led us right into, we are going to talk a little bit about some uh, potential NBA trade deadline moves as that is coming up. So, of course, it's a timely topic. Let's let's get into it. Um, Blake Griffin wants out. Um, Thoughts? Teams, what are we thinking there with with seventy two year old Blake Griffin? I'm sorry, uh, I just uh, no. Google says he's not quite seventy two, so uh, yeah, he just has well, the, the body of a seventy two year old. Sorry, that's 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 there's where I was confused. I I think since that hand has been shown, just like what Philadelphia did with Carson Wentz, the hand's been shown. So I think they're just going to wait because a buyout has been talked about pretty heavily in Detroit for Blake Griffin. Sure. He is unhappy in Detroit and I think he's going to get out of there as fast as he can. By ways of a potential suitor, it's it's a hard hard thing to really say because of the position that he plays. But I think if I had to pick one team in particular, the Clippers reunion 
wouldn't be off the table, in my opinion. Pair him up with Kawhi Leonard and Paul George. And, you know, now he has a Super Bowl star core he always wanted in L.A. Mm -hmm. And L.A. kind of needs a four that can also kind of spread out to try and help take on AD and LeBron with the Lakers. I think if he buys out, I I think L.A. Clippers just make the most sense to me. Yeah, I mean, I can, I you know, I, I'm a sucker for a reunion story. It's the, I'm not gonna lie to you, it's the biggest reason I thought Sherman might come back to Seattle to stay. Easy, easy call there to go back to make a reunion. So yeah, Blake Griffin. I think, I mean, and also let's be honest, if he does get bought out in Detroit, where is he gonna take his talents? He's not gonna go to. He's we're not gonna see him in Washington. He's not just gonna go, you know, whittle away, you know, somewhere that's not a contender. So yeah, I mean the Clippers and the Clippers are as a as a contender as any team out there. Um, you know what? It'd be kind of actually off the top of my head. You know where it'd be kind of cool? Phoenix pair him back up with Chris Paul. Lob City out in the desert, baby. Put him out in the valley. That's a contender right there. You throw him on there if you if he can give you twenty twenty five minutes a night off the bench, that's gonna help Phoenix's young core so much. Um, I think that might be the move, depending on the finances there. Also, don't be surprised if the Lakers are in on them just because the Lakers seem to be in on everybody. It doesn't matter. They don't have they're just they don't care. They're just accruing they're they're just gonna get everybody so nobody else can have them. They won't even play Blake Griffin. They'll get them and they'll just be like, cool, your bench spot's over there. Uh keep it warm. So it don't matter. The Lake, but who knows? Tade, Tade, you're shaking your head over there. Come on, give it to me. It'll be the Lakers. Lakers already have a good <laughs> squad on that their entire system. They don't need Blake Griffin. Blake Griffin is untradeable. That contract of his, what, thirty nine yep. million or something like that? Insane. <laughs> it's bad. It's bad. Because he got a ma- he got a max from the Clippers and then got traded literally the- before it was like the end of the first year. It was like the start of the first year of that contract. <laughs> yeah. But if he gets a buyout, uh, this, you know, if he wants to go to a team that's playoff bound. The Warriors. The Warriors are man-strapped. They have a lot of rookies. They have a lot of players that are vet- veterans, but they're not good. You know, there's a roster spot they can open up for him. Easy, you know. Sucks for Jeremy Lin because he's in the G League right now, getting ready when they need him. Yeah, he's working his way back. He's got technically a spot. Lin Sanity. Him Lin Sanity. He's been yeah. blown up in the G League, but, you know. What a fun ride that was. If the Warriors want to trade Kelly Oubre, Mm. There's a spot for Blake Griffin just to bring down that salary cap. Okay. That's my thought. Yeah. Like I said, I mean, it's pretty obvious he's going to end up, if he does get bought out, he's going to choose a, you know, a contender that fits for him. Um, I think any of the options we stated make just as much sense as any other ones. Um, so it, this one's an odd one. Do we think Bradley Beal could be on the move? Um God, get my man out of Washington. Dude, get him out of Washington. Just he I know he's got a he's got a decent contract. He's got uh what do we got? A twenty eight point eight million dollar salary hit with a player option next year, twenty twenty two. Man, he's worth every penny. Imagine if he were to able if imagine if he were to bring his offense, even even imagine for a moment if he could bring that kind of offensive power to a team like the Pacers, who are obviously in need of some extra firepower, you know, they're finding their offensive footing, but my God, adding a 30 point a night scorer like him changes the game for a team like the Pacers. So then even take it further. If he goes to a contending team already, that's kind of stacked. I mean, the possibilities are endless when it comes to that. So do we think Bradley Beal could be on the move guys? I think Washington is in full on sell mode. Sure. I, I don't see that record and see how they've been performing. Even they acquired Russell Westbrook. You know, you figured like, oh, hey, we, we upgraded theoretically from John Wall to Russell Westbrook and it has just not panned out. And Bradley Beal has made it very clear that he is annoyed with the team's effort. And I'm surprised he hasn't asked for a trade. I don't know how this man isn't showing up on the injury report because he carries that Washington team to the finish line night in and night out. That back has got to be hurt. He, he, I don't know how much longer he can do it. Yeah. So I think maybe a move to Phoenix makes sense. Move Devin Booker down to the three and run Bradley Beal to two. I I think that team would just be insane 
Now, yeah. salary wise, they'd have to make some make something work there. But I feel like a Phoenix trade would be a pretty decent one. The New York Knicks. All Knicks fans are probably going to flood to this podcast now because I mentioned something good for them. They're going to put me on Twitter. Like, Insider says, Bradley Beal might go to the Knicks before the trade deadline. Tade, how would you even know if they talked about you on Twitter? I'll see we'd, it on Reddit. It's fine. We'd have, <laughs> there you go. Lie. We'd, have to, we'd have to send it to you, but okay, that's fine. But no, Screenshots the Knicks. The Knicks are in a winnish mood now. You know, sure. the Bidot's doing work. He's got. We just got Rose. They have pieces to trade. Frank, sure. Nicoletta. You know, uh, yeah, they can work salary pretty easy in that team too. They can give Washington pieces and picks. Yeah, so I don't that... think Bradley Beal wants to leave because yeah, Washington which is, the... is literally his team now. No one else can take that team from him. <laughs> yeah. But if it's gonna be a team that takes Bradley Beal. The Knicks, sure, and we know the Knicks weren't afraid to spend money. So I yeah. mean, well, it's a, a he out Alfred, he out Alfred Russell Westbrook, which is like I mean, he, he looked needs- at him dead in the eyes and goes, "I am the captain. I don't give a damn who you are." Yeah, which he, he needs a trophy for that because I'm not sure if I thought anybody could out straight out out Alpha Russell Westbrook. So, all right, our next player we're going to talk about uh, is a familiar one to us. He's a player that uh, got moved once this year. Could potentially get moved again. Um, that man we kind of hinted at earlier when we were talking Houston and Indy. Uh, Victor Oladipo potentially could be on the move again. Uh, he has, I mean, when he was in Indy, he made it pretty vocal uh, that he not only, you know, wanted, it wasn't even, as far as I know, it wasn't even necessarily he wanted out of Indy. It was that he wanted to go to Miami pretty badly. So, when he went to when he was traded to Houston, he was still like he kind of as far as I've seen, read, heard, whatever. He's kind of been like, "Cool, this is fun and all." Y'all remember I said I want to go to Miami, right? Like I still want to go to Miami. This is Houston, not Miami. I don't know if we took a left turn in Albuquerque, but we're in Houston. I still want to head down to the beach, down to Miami, and hook up with Jimmy Butler and those guys. So he could potentially be on the move uh, before the trade li- deadline now, which would be a very interesting kind of timeline of events. If something like that were to happen for him and how, how much he's moved around and gone through in the last six months or so. And I definitely think that because the Houston knew that they were getting, they were going to get a one-year rental on Victor Lodipo. Yeah. But I feel like the Celtics need one more piece. I feel like they're in, they're in that aggressive buy now mode and they can get most out on just saying like, Hey, we know you're going to go down to Miami. You're probably not going to win Jack Diddley all in Miami. Mm-hmm. So this is your year. Get a ring with Jason Tatum and, you know, kind of push that boundary, that ceiling that they've had that they can't seem to really get over that hump right now in Boston. So I think they're going to get aggressive at the trade deadline. And I think Victor Oladipo is going to be a guy if they're like heavily looking at is the guy they're going to get. What do you think, yeah. buddy? And, you know, that would make sense. You know, I actually think Old Depot would stay in Houston. He's the new guy. You know, him and John, he wants to play with people that he thinks are good. John Wall is showing he's really good. Sure. Bogey Cousins is showing he's really good. Houston's yeah. doing really well recently. They're being really competitive. Can Miami even pay for Victor Old Depot next year? That's a big so. question. That's a big question because I mean they've got to you got to think they got to value guys, not only Jimmy Butler and Bam higher than they would value Oladipo, but I mean they've got role players that helped lead them to that finals matchup last year that yeah, are going to get paid at some point. Tyler yeah. Hero is going to get paid at some point. Duncan Robinson is going to get paid at some point. Um, you know, so there there's a lot of pieces that are on the move. Uh, that are there. So Michael kind of half answered his part of our next question. Um, I'm going to keep it short and simple. Uh, our next question, do the, do we think the Pacers and the Boston Celtics potentially add another piece to the deadline? I'm going to make it easy for me. Uh, I think, yes, the Celtics look to add a piece, whether it's a, a guy like Oladipo or not. I think they add somebody because, as Michael said, they're kind of in a win-now mode. The East is kind of up for grabs. Milwaukee doesn't look like 
the Milwaukee that everybody kind of feared last year or last couple of years um, and who still faltered in the playoffs anyway. Milwaukee doesn't look near that strong right now. Miami doesn't look like the defending Eastern Conference champions at all right now. So the East is kind of open. Philly looks really good, but everybody kind of seems to think, and so do I, that the you know, the law of average is going to catch up, catch up to them. They're going to take a step back or so something kind of has to give. We don't really think they can keep the pace up for 76 games or however many 72 games that we're playing this year. Um, so they, who knows what they can do? I mean, and my, like I said, Boston looks good. I mean, Boston is just as much of a chance to win, you know, to think that they can win the East right now as anybody. So I think they might add a, a strong quality piece or two. The Pacers, however, I don't think they're going to add anybody. I do not expect any moves for the Pacers just because, they're waiting on guys to get healthy anyway. They're, they don't know what they have right now. So if you don't know what you have, you don't really know what you're missing. And if you don't know what you're missing, what's the reason you go out and make a move and try to add somebody at the deadline? You're At that point, you're just kind of throwing blind darts and hoping something hits a bullseye. So I don't, I don't see them adding a piece. I mean, when it comes to the Pacers... I, I, they are they are notorious for staying really quiet around the trade deadline. Yeah, but here recently we've seen the Pacers get more and more aggressive. It seems like they're ring chasing, and with the team kind of stuck in third gear, I don't know if they're going to try and move a bench piece that could potentially be a starter or move a guy that has maybe been slowly underperforming, but is still a valuable piece that they don't think is going to be in their long-term future. Like we have Karis Levert, we have TJ Warren. If he regains that same level of scoring that he had in the bubble last year, he's going to be a monster. So is there a guy that they're looking at on their bench or even a guy that's currently getting a lot of minutes right now that might be a starter somewhere else that they could move to get one more piece to the puzzle and see if they can chase that ring now rather than the wait next year. Cause I'm sure they don't want to end up like the Atlanta Hawks did for years, that Mm. seven to four seed where they're always in the mix, but they're never good enough to get anybody good in the draft or never bad enough to get anybody good in the draft, but they're not good enough to get win at all either. Yep. And I feel like they either have to get aggressive or they have to sell so that way they can get more picks to trade back up into the lottery and get somebody good down the road. So it's just, it's just finding that mix. Yeah. Yeah, No Pacers aren't going to Evan Turner this year. We're not going to go trade (laughs) our center core team guy for someone who's going to stick around for one year and then leave. (laughs) So we're not going to make any moves. Tade sounds like he's been holding on to that one. He's been holding on to that, that salty move. Uh, so we're gonna okay, we're gonna talk some some a lot more fun I think and a lot uh, it's a it lends itself to an easy kind of debate back and forth who deserves it who didn't uh, the All Star starters were announced uh, yesterday or two days ago as of this they were announced Thursday night is the, I guess the way to say that sorry this is still episode two we're still figuring out this whole podcasting thing um, and uh, our two key captains our two team captains are uh, shocker. We're looking at LeBron James and uh, Kevin Durant. Who would have freaking guessed it? That's amazing. Never seen it. Uh, so for Team LeBron, we've got LeBron James. Whoa. Who'd have thought that? He is a holy crap 17-time All-Star in his 17th season, uh, having a ridiculous year, 25 points a game, eight over eight rebounds a game, just about eight assists a game. Uh, Steph Curry somehow, some way. Shanghai everybody into thinking he's an all-star starter. Um, he's a seven-time star, seven-time all-star. He is averaging 30 points a game, five boards, six assists. Uh, Luka, Luka Doncic, also in that backcourt. We're looking at him as a seven-time all-star, 30 points a game this year, five rebounds, six assists. Wait, no, I missed that one. See, episode two. So we're still working this out. Luka, two-time all-star, 29 points a game. Eight and a half rebounds a game, nine and a half assists a game. Luka is having an outstanding year, nearly averaging a triple double. Jokic, no surprise there. Three. This is his third All Star appearance. Twenty seven points a game, eleven boards, and eight assists. And a Kawhi rounds out Team Braun. He's a five time All Star now. 
26 points a game, nearly six rebounds a game, and five assists a game. I'm tired. Michael, tell us about Team KD. With Team Kevin Durant, you have obviously Kevin Durant, 11-time All-Star with 29 points per game, 7.3 rebounds per game, and five assists per game. Lining up with him is his teammate, Kyrie, Uncle Drew Irving, (laughs) with 28 points per game, 4.6 rebounds per game, and 5.7 assists per game. And then you have the process, but I think it's about to drop 50. Tade, I hope you bet on that. Um, Four-time All-Star with 29 points per game, 10 rebounds per game. So he's averaging a double-double and three assists per game. But who cares? He plays center. And then you have the Greek freak in Giannis, who is a five-time All-Star, 28 point per game, 11 rebounds per game. So he's also averaging a double-double and five assists per game. That man needs to change his last name because Jesus. And then <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to try it. Oh, no. No, uh, I will butcher that. And I'm not it's, about to disrespect that man because he is on Tentacupo, baby. On Tentacupo. Okay. Yeah. On to Bradley Beal, who has a normal last name, a uh, three time All Star. And get this 32 points per game, 5.2 rebounds per game, and 4.7 assists per game. When I said, that that man's back has to be killing him mm-hmm. for carrying Washington. I was not kidding. That man <laughs> so, is has the highest point per game totals out of everybody on KD's team. Yep. And look for him to come up big in that game, especially is because it, there's no defense being played. He might drop 80. Yeah. Is it is it bad that I'm almost more surprised that he's averaging nearly five assists a game than the 32 points? Because of course he's going to get his points, but like the fact that he's dishing the ball to other teammates and they're actually hitting buckets five times a game. Like, that seems crazy to me. I'm sorry. I it's all with the uh, KD mentality. It's like, now I'm not going to pass it to you. Just get the rebound. That's you called that KD mentality. Drew. That's oh, I say, I, did I say KD? I definitely meant uh, Kobe. Kobe. Okay, I, wow. I, I was, apologize. I was like, "Wow, that's that's a hundred twenty percent." Yeah, that's a hundred twenty percent Mamba mentality there. I'm surprised Todd didn't jump on that before I even did. Um, Talking about Keen Tady, I got confused. I I apologize. All right, so I'll real quick. Do we have any problems with any of the starters? Any 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 surprises there? Any any issues? I know I've got one, but I don't I don't I'll I'll wait a second. Let's uh, you know one. what? We have to I announce the team. One. We got. We got to announce the teams. Let's let's let Tade let's let Tade answer this oh, one first. Tade, Tade, you got any issues with Team KD or Team LeBron here? Oh, with the starters, at how least. How is the best team in the NBA not have a starter? Where is Rudy Gobert and where is Donovan Mitchell? They have the best team in the NBA. They don't have a starter. Are I can you- give you two. I can give you a two-word answer if you want it. Well, what was it? Curry MVPs. What? Fan, fan voting. voting. Hey, there it is. It's fan voting was the issue. So fans like Spider Man. I mean, He's the best. Can, Who doesn't like can him? Can you blame? Right. Can you blame the fans for not getting Rudy Gobert in after the stunt he pulled last year? All right, good point. Uh, yeah, you're not wrong. I'm pretty point. sure everyone's Donovan Mitchell. Everybody loves Rudy him. Gobert. He's with Shaq. Yeah, I'm thinking more. Him. I'm thinking more Donovan Mitchell. And you know what's funny? If Donovan Mitchell had been a starter, you know whose spot he would have rightfully taken? Chef Curry, who is leading. Wow. And a, hold on. I got this. Hold on. He is leading a. Come on, phone. He is leading a team to a whopping 16 and 14 record. Who on lost a, to Orlando tonight. I was <laughs> on, a, on a one game losing streak. Woo. That's a team I'm afraid of. I mean, I still feel like out of everybody who's picked, I still it's it's Chef Curry. You knew he was gonna get the fan vote. Right. I'm more shocked that Damian Lillard didn't get in over Luca for the starters. Was my big thing. Yeah. Damian Lillard is arguably one of the most popular basketball players in the world. Apparently and that one did come down to fan voting. Out. It's odd. Yeah, like because he, yeah. he won player voting mm-hmm. and coach voting. And he lost pretty massively. And the fan voting to Luca, which I'm a big Luca fan. Right. I voted for Luca. I love Luca, but I still feel like Dame earned that starter spot. Yeah. But yeah there was no way he was going to get it in over Chef Curry. Just, fan voting. There was just no way it was going to happen. I'm just curious. So you said you voted for Luca. 
Yeah. But you're surprised. I still thought he was going to get in over the spot that you voted him for. I. It wasn't like I voted like, hey, pick one. You got to pick Luka Doncic. <laughs> you got to pick Luka Doncic. Sure. Pick one. I got you. Like, no, like I still yeah. feel like between Luka, Steph, and da- and Damian Lillard, that I was shocked sure. Damian Lillard didn't get one of those spots. Okay, because he has been balling out in Portland this year. Right, and he's All obviously right. going to be my pick. Kind of transitioning here. Yeah, I we're want to talk about who is yeah. who's going to be our one pick for the East and West brand, uh, there, bench spots. There, yeah, there you go. Damian Lillard is obviously my pick because he has a – hold on, let me pull it up really quick. 29 points per game, four rebounds per game, 7.7 assists per game, including on the 17th, he had a 43-point double-double with 16 assists. The man is balling out, but I don't know if it's just because it's Portland and, you know, yeah. it's Portland. <laughs> you know, he doesn't really get that primetime games. He gets those late-night – ESPN spots because LA is playing and they're obviously going to take that Brian Stein spot. Yeah. And I just think that, you know, Damon, Damon Lillard has to be in it. There's no way he's not going to be. And then my second pick for the East, it's got to be the man who's leading the league in blocks. He will bring, finally bring some defense to this all-star game, especially you know, since he'll just run you down and slam that thing away. He is the perfect, the poster child of the chase down block. And that of course is my man, Miles Turner with 13 points per game, six, I'm sorry, 13 points per game, six rebounds per game. And of course, like I said, the three and a half blocks per game, which is a full block per game more than Todd A's man, Rudy Gobert, <laughs> you know, Mr. Mike toucher himself. And I feel like after, especially after he just kind of, you know, balled out. It's got to be either him or Sabonis from the Patriots that gets that spot, if not both. But Chris, I'm kind of curious. Who do you got? Yeah, so, you know, when you talk about who, I'm just trying to consider more, not necessarily, I mean, who's a lock for for one of these spots, right? And I think for the East, uh, as much as I love the Pacers, it was hard to kind of ignore that team and ignore some of those guys on there. You know, Brogdon has a chance to make it. Miles Turner obviously has a shot to make it too. But I think if you have to take a lock and you got to get one guy from that team, it's got to be Domas Sabonis because he hits all those marks that you're looking for in an All Star. He's already been there, so you know he's found a, like so he's found a niche in the national voting, like fan voting, like fan voting helped get him in last year. The players voted for him too. The media voted for him. He's gotten that attention to get himself to the all-star game. So he's backed that up this year. He has three triple doubles this year, including that one the other night in an overtime win in Minnesota where he dropped, are you ready for this? 36 points, 17 rebounds and 10 assists. He's averaging 21 and a half points a game. 11 and a half rebounds a game. So he's averaging that double double. He had that long double double streak uh, to start the year in nearly first 20 games, I believe. He had a double double in every single game. And he's also averaging nearly six assists a game. And for a fun fact of the night, just to rub it in Tade's face, this season, he is averaging one whole made three pointer a game. I did find that little beautiful nugget. So he's averaging one three a game. So Fun fact, if you're betting Just anything games I bet on. <laughs> yeah. It's an average Tade. Sometimes he goes over that mark and sometimes he goes under that mark. Uh, and he also has won a player of the week award, believe it or not, this year. So he clearly has the attention of the national media, the some of the fans and the players to get himself that all that second all-star appearance. And in the West, it's gotta be my man down in the valley, Devin Booker. He's doing his thing. He has super he has superstar written all over him. He really does. He's got 24 and a half points a game this year, 3.7 rebounds a game and four and a half assists per game. But here's the thing. Here's why I think he deserve, he's going to get a spot over some other guys. The NBA is all about moments, right? The NBA is all about highlights and memorable. Like, where were you when this happened? He has that clutch gene, that ice in his veins, D'Angelo Russell today. He's got that ice in his veins, cold blooded man. He hit, y'all remember a couple of weeks ago, he had a game winning three over Dallas at the beginning of this month on February 1st in his first game back from an extended injury where he missed like six straight games. And he just came back, hit a crazy three. They were down two. So they needed a three to win and not go for the tie. And he nailed it. And then 
there's the shot of the shot the bu- of, of the bubble, the shot heard around the world last year, that iconic buzzer beater he hit in the bubble over Paul George and the Clippers back in August with that legendary photo taken of him laying flat on his back and kind of, I almost call it like a reverse plank where he was so just flat, arms to his side, head lifted up, absolute baller moment. And did you guys know he actually has the most buzzer beaters in Phoenix Suns franchise history already with four? He has four buzzer beating game winning shots in his very early career. That's my lock for the West. Tade, what do you got? Oh, he also has won a player of the week award this year. So if if I'm using that as a factor for a Sabonis, guess what? Kind of plays into a factor for Booker as well. You know, for the East, ah. Uh... I, I, I got to pick him because I love him. Julius Randle. Hmm. Okay. You know, he's on a playoff team. Okay. He's putting up great numbers. He's an anchor sure. on defense. He was drafted by my Lakers when Kobe was still there, you know, during his Vino years. Yeah. You know, I just, I just think Julius Randle deserves to be on an all-star bench there. Out there on the West. Oh, my goodness. It gets a little bit more difficult because there's always so many good players in the West that never make it to the all-star game. I hate to do this, the (laughs) poor guy, but you know, I wanted Chris Paul to be on this list too. Yeah. He's not going to be on this list. Sorry, buddy. But you know, thinking back at it, you know, throw DeMar DeRozan on there. Oh, he's playing like an all-star level and with the San Antonio Spurs, other Spurs that good. No. Is sure. he balling out? Yeah. Throw him on that list, too. That's right. my, that's, that, that one's a little more of a hot take, but <laughs> throw him on there. Okay. Uh, um, so, Todd A., uh, really quickly, I really want to talk to you. Like, Do you have any any locks this week, like, bet-wise? Like, you got any things where we can maybe make some money? Some... All right, guys, everybody. Guys, 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 this is, this is legendary. This is a big moment. I want this I, I, inbred this, like get this in your brain. So this is a huge in moment. For you. I don't even know, man. I'm making up words. <laughs> it's that big. It's that big of a moment. We've got Tade's bets of the weeks of the week. I mean, I'm so excited. I can't even talk right now. Tade, please take it away. Take the mic from me. I can't do this. This is just too get much for me, Chris. You look done. Away. I'm going to take your mic. I'm just going to, that's yeah, go ahead. I'm a, all right. Hey. We're going to do three things. I'll give you parlays. I'll give you a lock. And I'll give you something to avoid. You can bet on multiple different apps legally. FanDuel, if you want to do parlays for the same game. DraftKings, if you want promotions out the wazoo. You can do MGM Sports. You can do Barstool if you like Barstool, but don't do them because they suck. All right. Let's get started. I use DraftKings. It's wonderful. I love the bonuses. Let's go with our MASH. We're going to mash together something for a parlay. This will be over the week. First, I like Miami over LA. LA, Davis is out. Schroeder's out. Miami is doing well. Then, attach that parlay. Phoenix over Memphis. I think Phoenix is going to dominate them. And the third game I'll put on this parlay, Portland over Washington. Now, Washington is 5-5 five and five in their last 10. They've gone really well. Mm. And, you know, Portland's last game they had on Thursday, uh, it was a close one against uh, uh, New Orleans. They only won by two. But Enos Kander's doing great as a center. Uh, you know, Damian Lillard's doing great. Uh, CJ McConnell's out. But I think they still edge over Washington just for the fact that their bench is better than Washington, half of Washington starters. So parlay Miami over LA Phoenix over Memphis and Portland over Washington. Now the cash section here of the little betting segment bound bam to score over 20 points. LA has horrible defense. When it comes to our centers. Yeah, sure. Marcus Gasol and Montrez Harrell. Montrez Harrell isn't going to defend. Marcus Gasol is going to get tired because he's old. And Bam doesn't have to deal with Davis. He has to deal with Kuzma. That is a major downgrade on defense. So, cash bet right there. 
Bam to hit over 20 points. Because he averages 19. He's got to get over that. Let's face it, people. Trash. Don't bet on college games. They're wild. I hate them. There's so many times a college game, they'll give you odds. Oh, yeah, this team's going to beat them. No way, no chance. They lose. They lose. (laughs) I've lost more college games just because I bet on the people that I thought, oh, yeah, they have great odds to win. No, that doesn't work. Next thing, don't bet on the Washington Wizards because they're 5-5 five and five right now in the past 10 games. Are they going to win? Are they going to lose? If you want to bet on an underdog, sure. Go ahead and bet Washington. If you you want, you want think you know they're going to win, don't bet because they're tricking you. It's 50-50 shot. Don't do that. And, uh, and Tade, where are, we, where are we calling this mash, cash, trash? Like, what, mash, where, where are we calling this, buddy? Mash, trash. Wait, that's Man? almost... What? Is that is that MCT? MCT? Hey. What? Oh my! I didn't even notice. Dig wow! Dig it. Are you kidding? We me? did not what? spend like a whole <laughs> week trying. Yeah, to get we that haven't. Out, we we haven't done right on the spot. Yeah, we didn't change players around or nothing. Wow. <laughs> also, hold on. Um, Chris, am I, buddy? Am I reading this outline right? I think uh, training I think start, re- and we're not talking MLB. I think you're reading the same dude. thing. Yeah, you're. Yeah, you're. I, you t- I was gonna ask you the same thing that I'm like, dude, we're 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 nearing the end of episode two, and like, we haven't talked any stickball, we haven't talked any baseball. Um, I mean, there's there's got to be a reason for that, right? There, we don't we would just forget about our favorite sport, right? I, we we definitely definitely aren't, which is why me and Chris are happy to announce. Drum roll, please. That's really loud. I'm not going to wake up my four-year-old. Um, <laughs> that next Tuesday, we will be having a collaboration with the Crash Course Podcast for a full spring training episode of the MCT slash Crash Course Podcast with special guests. Um, all right, it's going to be one of my good friends. His name is Bryce Williams. Super nice dude, super knowledgeable, especially about prospects. I cannot wait to see what he thinks about the, uh, this minor league system, especially with a guy by the name of Jason Dominguez. Mm. Dude really looks like the seventh. Uh, oh, my gosh. Oh <laughs> you my guys gosh. remember that scene in Benchformers where the guy came up and like <laughs> and says, I am 12. That is Jason Dominguez. The man's a beast. Yes. And then, oh my uh, God. Chris, do you, you got you got somebody else on the show, too, right? We got we, yeah. we got Craig. I mean, yeah, we just here. being left in the closet. Yeah, yeah, but... yeah. Tade, Tade had a fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. I mean, what was? I mean, what was the third part of your little MCT there? It was trash, right? What do we do with the trash? We take that out of take here. That. So, we uh, now we're doing you a favor, Tade. We know you don't want to sit here for an hour and just look at a pre- look at a screen and look pretty for an hour without talking some baseball. So, we're uh. We're gonna believe it or not, Tade. We're doing this for you. We're 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 gonna we're gonna fill your seat uh, with somebody you and I are both familiar with. Perhaps you're probably even I think you're way more familiar with him than I am. We're, we're gonna bring on the one, the only, the legendary Matt Michael, uh, one of Tade and I's great friends, uh, really close friends. Super excited to have him on. Uh, I have a feeling he's gonna be a semi regular on this podcast when uh, we get to talk stickball because he is as knowledgeable about the sport and as passionate about the sport as they come, even though he is a Chicago White Sox fan. I am a Chicago Cubs fan. I do not apologize for that. Uh, So it's actually part of why I want to bring him on. We're going to have a lot of fun banter back and forth. We had some great banter back 2014, 2015 uh, leading into the Cubs window that uh that, that they were in for a while there and and what the white Sox were doing so i'm really excited to bring him on so right now it's looking like the lineup is going to be myself mr michael down there uh our great todd and i's great buddy matt michael michael's friend bryce michael's great friend bryce super knowledgeable for prospects excited to have him to meet him actually and then the one the only the super legendary the man the myth the legend himself craig crash is going to grace us with his presence and take our little show that he has helped create and kind of bring us up uh, onto the Crash Course podcast level. So we're super excited uh, for that opportunity. Like Michael said, that's going to be next Tuesday. You can find us then. Uh, and it's going to be just a baseball special. We just, we, we couldn't, we, we didn't want to have 
to be to be cut off talking baseball this time of year this week so we decided you know what we're going to open it up we're going to open the floor up we're going to bring some guys in we're going to extend it out and just just go all out uh with what a crazy year last year was with the shortened season and everything we got so much to kind of come back from when it comes to that so uh not to give too much away but it is going to be fun you aren't going to want to miss it but guys we're we're doing the mct podcast right we're trying to like make this thing what it is we're trying to start some traditions and the one tradition we've got is our picks of the week and guess what we're back at it uh we were if i can recall i believe we were over three last week right uh i think we all missed on ours so let's try to if we can all hit guys if we all pull our weight and do our part we can get back to 500 on the uh, on the year if you will we'll go back to three and three let's try to get some right michael lead us off strong with your game of the week but what are you looking for well, my game of the week was originally going to be uh, Pacers versus Houston. but uh, God damn it. We are that, not on that, a good track. <laughs> I, I think that technically makes us 0-4. Uh, uh. But uh, I, I decided to go with the Nets versus the Clippers on Sunday. It's going to be a star-studded matchup. And oh, yeah. I, I have to go with my boy, Paul George. I know what he did to Indianapolis. People still hate him here. I love me some Paul George. But I think that with with everybody they have on that team, with Kawhi and PG, if they can continue to play where they're at, if PG plays, that's gonna be the key thing. If PG plays, and if Kawhi is still out, not Kawhi, um, Kyrie is still out, I think it's gonna be kind of a toss up. But I think the Clippers are gonna get it done. I think it's gonna be a high scoring affair, and if it's not, I'm gonna be sorely disappointed. But I think it's gonna be 130 to 129 with the Clippers with PG getting a game winning shot over James Harden just for fun. Just for, just for kicks and giggles. Just, I'm just looking, for fun. There we go. I'm, I'm also keyed in on the Western conference. Um, let's be honest. I think it's a much more, I'm not going to lie. I think it's a much more competitive conference at this point um, from top to bottom. I am looking at currently the, um, the one seed and the two seed. They're going to match up on Wednesday, February 24th next week. Uh, it's going to be those LA Lakers uh, facing off against the Utah Jazz. And I'm not going to lie, as it sits right now, guys, that could be your Western Conference Finals matchup. Let's be real. And so it's it's going to be a huge matchup. It's a big test, I think, for not just for the Jazz, but for both teams. Um, I will admit right off the bat, this game is going to lose a little bit of its potential luster because I don't because Anthony Davis will not play. Um, so that obviously takes away a lot of the Lakers firepower, but let's be honest too. They still have a guy by the name of LeBron James. He's LeBron James. He's going to do LeBron James things. Um, the jazz as of Thursday, they're on a nine game win streak. Damn. That's a lot in a row to never falter. That's, that's a lot in basketball to win nine straight. I don't care who you are. I don't care who you played. Uh, you could play Washington nine times and you probably don't win all nine of them. Let's be real. So, they're obviously really good. Uh, they do it all. They score. They've got the superstars. I talked about them last week. Yeah, they can. The, the thing that makes them, I think, different this year than last year is they have kind of figured out that defense. They, they can absolutely lock you down when they need to. And let's be honest, the playoffs in basketball are one with your defense. If you can, you need timely stops. You need to lock teams down because you're going to face a lot of high offenses in the playoffs. You need to be able to match up with them and lock them down. Uh, Lakers are still the Lakers, as I mentioned. You know, LeBron's in year 17. Uh, LeBron's NBA career is about to be a full-fledged adult, guys. Like, it's kind of crazy and ridiculous to think about. Uh, but he is still LeBron James. So it it's a good matchup. I mean, it's a great test to see the Jazz, see if they've got what it takes to kind of dethrone the King, potentially work on taking the West. Um but also I think a good test for the Lakers to kind of figure out how do we play when we don't have, when we're not at full power, when we don't have Anthony Davis, what is our option? Because the playoffs are also one with depth, no matter how good your starters are, you need role pieces, role players, and you need your depth. My prediction is going to be the jazz actually going to take this one in a somewhat low scoring game. I'm looking at one Oh nine, one Oh three in favor of Utah. It's kind of funny that a low scoring game of the NBA now is still hundred points each. So uh, but yeah, 109, 103, Utah gets the uh, big win to keep their, their streak rolling, their confidence going. Well, first off, I'd like to say, Chris, that's very rude of you not to think Alex Caruso is not an all star caliber player on that team. You're right. Uh, You're right. Why would I not think? 
why would I not think that Ale little me-sized Alex Caruso can replace Anthony Davis, who's you, Todd A-sized? You don't watch so, enough Lakers right. games, I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, I can wear, I can say that with pride that I do not watch enough Lakers games. Sticking to the Western Conference, uh, I'm going to pick the Monday 9 p.m. Eastern game of Portland versus Phoenix. Mm. I think uh, I think Phoenix is going to come out on top on this game, probably. 126 118 it's gonna be a good battle you know portland doesn't have a true starting center on that team because Nurkic is out while the suns do the suns also have more shooting right now than portland would like but i think it's gonna be a rough gritty battle they're all gonna okay. chuck threes and i love threes <laughs> so that's my pick of the week all right. Well, hopefully we, uh, like I said, hopefully we hit on all of those, get back to 500 on the uh, unofficial year, if you will. And uh, you can catch us every Saturday on the old YouTube machines at the MCT podcast. We are a, a part of that wonderful 3C media family. We were gracious enough to be brought on into under that umbrella and under that wing. You can find us, as I said, every Saturday on YouTube. We will be there uh, every week. Uh, next week is Michael and I are excited and mentioned we've got that baseball special that should be up Tuesday and you can always find well at least Michael and I on the Twitters at our ads right there on the screen mine's Mr. Topher you see it spelled out there in front of you and Michael's there is drive true with a one there in the eye very clever very very innovative there thank you guys once again this was super fun we're having such a great time doing this um for my co-hosts, uh, Tade and my and Michael, we did it once again, guys. Episode two, there it is. Unwrapped it up. We're out of here. We'll see you all next week.